right, folks, here we are. Welcome back again. This is part one, actually part two, I should say, uh, turn one of my replay of Brandywine from the Great Battles of the American Revolution series by GMT Games. And uh, if you haven't seen the intro, go back and check it out. It'll be posted in the description. Um, I'm about to begin. And uh, to start off, I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail with the gameplay and the rules. Basically, it'll save me a lot of time if I show you what I'm doing and give you the results of that. However, that said, I will show, I will highlight some of the rules uh, and some of the movements and rolls of the dice and stuff where it would be appropriate. Uh, perhaps to highlight an important combat, for instance. Maybe I'll play that all out, but we'll see how that goes later in the video. But for starters, let's take a quick look uh, at the turn sequence. Uh, this is the abbreviated sequence of play for the game. And first thing is determine reinforcements. They will be placed in their hex of entry, which doesn't count towards their movement. Uh, that should be taken care of. The next thing is initiative determination. Now, in this one, for the first turn, we're skipping because the British automatically have initiative the first turn. That means they're considered the initiative player and will go first. And as you can see here, that is the next step. The initiative player turn, which will be the British in this case. I'll indicate that on the turn record track, of course. And the first thing they do is go through all their movement. So where they move their units from their starting hexes. Uh, in this case, there's only one hex, one entry point for troops that are coming on the board, which I'll show in a second. They will be moving. And once that is complete, we go to the rally phase. After that is defensive artillery fire phase. Now, this is the only time artillery fires, actually. Uh, it's during this phase, and it's the opponent that gets to fire. In this case, it'll be the Patriots. They'll be firing their cannon if they've got something in range, typically three hexes or less distance. After that's resolved, we go to rifle fire. Rifle armed troops, they have a little R symbol on their unit counter, will be able to fire against a target that is adjacent to them. Typically, it's that's the maximum range, one hex. Uh, and that will be resolved. After that, any units that are adjacent uh, will conduct close combat, and so on and so forth. Once that's finished, we go to the second player's turn. In this case, it would be the Patriots. And they basically do the same thing again, all the way down to close combat. Then end of turn segment. And this is where we check for automatic victory and so on and so forth. One turn will have been completed. Advance the turn marker to the next turn. And we slip all the way back up to reinforcements. Determine initiative, which will be turn two. There will be an initiative roll. Both sides will roll a d10. And they'll add their army morale initiative modifier if there is one. In this case, there will be. I'll get into that. And we determine who is the initiative player for that turn and so on and so forth. An important thing to note is that momentum can be used to determine initiative, uh, as well as other things, and neither side in this scenario starts with any momentum. So both sides are going to have to uh, do good in close combat if they want to gain some momentum chits. There is a pool of five in the, in the battle, and that's the max available. So if there are chits available, and you gain one, you get to pull a chit. Anyway, this is the sole entry point for the British currently in turn one. Let me get down here. Uh, these are the only troops coming on in turn one. And it's indicated on their unit mark, unit counter, actually. It says 1A on these units here. That means first turn, point A, which is right there. So uh, during reinforcement placement, all these units uh, would be stacked on this hex. doesn't count towards their movement. They will be able to move from this location. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my Dragoons on, probably take up a position up here. I don't, maybe they'll draw some artillery fire. Uh, that'll be followed up by the Queen's Rangers and Ferguson's Rifles. These are the only rifle-armed troops I have currently. And they also have a first fire marker, which means they're going to get a bonus the first time they fire. These guys will be moving on um, after the Dragoons, and they're going to be taking up positions uh, basically right here. I also want to follow up with my other infantry to get in contact with these troops, these light, in, light troops for the Patriots on those slopes. I basically want to drive them back, get them off those slopes. 
they have strength one and two, so it's not going to be too difficult. We should drive them back. I kind of want to get my artillery up last, up on the road, uh, preferably to get in range, about three hexes of this position up top where Maxwell is located behind those breastworks. Probably won't be very effective, but I do want to start letting off some rounds with my artillery into this position. I want to get Maxwell out of there, as well as drive back his lights. So that's the plan. That's how they're going to deploy onto the table. We'll see what happens, and let's get into it. All right, so there it is. That's the completion of the British movement step. And take a quick look at this. You can see Ferguson's is bringing up the flank on the slopes. You see when you uh, are adjacent, move adjacent to an enemy unit, you have to stop moving. And if there are rifles, you pay an extra movement point to enter that hex as well as to vacate that hex. So we got Ferguson's down here on the flank. They're down slope of these guys. Not, a, not the best position. Uh, we've got the 49th Regiment. We've got the Welsh Fusiliers also here stacked with the 28th foot. It's a total of six strength points in this hex. We also have Gnipausen in the back here, able to support if necessary. We have the artillery located here, as well as the King's Own Regiment of foot supporting them. You don't want to leave your cannon uh, unprotected. Otherwise, it's easy to capture those guns. And finally, the Queen's Rangers have taken up a position here. So we're all on the bottom of these slopes. We're going to work our way up, drive these light infantry back as quickly as possible. Uh, get some rifle fire in, I think. And yeah, this looks pretty good to me. And I'll hopefully get some artillery fire on this position as well. So what I'll do here is I'll show you guys artillery fire, how it works. It's very uh, simple, and it works the same way with rifle fire. Uh, but right after the rally phase, if you remember, comes the defensive artillery fire phase, and that's the Patriots. And they really only have one unit to be considered here, and that's right here, this battery of guns. So I put it on the top of the stack here. Now, they're upslope from this position here. They have a range of three, and they have to have a line of sight to their target. Now, units, counters, block line of sight. Leaders don't, but actual units do. Shooting this way, they're going to do some counter battery fire uh, down this road here, and they basically pick one of these units to target, and it's going to be the artillery. I'm going to go after them just because it's fun. Uh, show you guys how it works. So this artillery unit with a strength of one will be firing on this artillery unit with counter battery fire, uh, which has a strength of two, which doesn't play a role in this case because the British are not firing. So let's see how this works. Get our dice and our modifiers ready. All set and good to go. I'll show you a quick peek of the table. Basically what we have to do here is we have to look at the actual range. Now the artillery up on the slopes is three hexes away. Let me double check that. One, two. Actually it's two hexes away uh, from the British uh, battery. So basically, we cross-reference the strength points of the shooting battery, which is one in this case, not very strong. And we're going to cross-reference it with the range to the target, which is two. So the result of that is, you guessed it, nine. That's our two-hit number. We need to roll a nine and a ten-sided die score a hit. And there are modifiers to this die roll. Not many, but there they are. And let's see which ones are going to apply. Not the first one. Uh, target is light infantry? No. Target occupies woods, light woods, or orchard? No. Fire into field works? No. Target is artillery? Yes, it is. There's a plus one to that roll. Uh, rifle unit firing for the first time? There's a plus one for that, as I mentioned earlier. Ferguson's rifles also gets a bonus in their own right on top of that. And yeah, so the only one that applies here is a plus one to the roll. Target is artillery. And we're going to roll that. So what's make our roll. And we're going to count the red die for the British and the blue die for the Patriots. So they need a nine or higher. And they got a nine. Plus one is ten. Roll of ten, here's what happens. That means we scored a hit. It was effective fire. The next thing we do is we go to the damage table. 
Uh, there's a rifle damage table, and there's an artillery fire damage table. We're, we're going to look at the fire damage table. This is what you roll on. Basically, you're rolling a second time when you score a hit with rifles or artillery. Uh, keep in mind that musketry fire, just your standard infantry musketry fire, doesn't actually go through this sequence. They don't actually shoot. Uh, what they do is their shooting, their musketry fire, would be part of close combat. So that's a whole different resolution. So they don't actually shoot like rifles and artillery do. It's built into the close combat step of the turn. So the next thing we do is we roll a d10 again. There's no modifiers to this. We're looking for a result. Okay, we already know we have a hit. Now we want to get a, a nice juicy result. And all these are coded uh, results, which are described over here. As you can see, R is a retreat. D is a disruption. There's also numbers, which represent step losses. A single step loss means you flip the counter over to its weaker side. If it has a weaker side, if it doesn't, it's removed. And so on and so forth. Army morale uh, penalty. So the army morale, this thing down here, would drop minus one if that result was achieved. This one right here, the eight. And so on and so forth. I'm quite surprised they got a hit with that. It wasn't much strength points. So we roll again, and we'll see what we get. And we got a one. Wouldn't you believe it? Again, there's no modifiers to this. And look, our die roll under the artillery damage table, it is a one. So we get an R result, which is retreat. So the enemy cannon will have a retreat result. I want to make a little correction here. You guys might have seen what I did here. That second die roll for the artillery uh, on this table, uh, I was looking at this category. And that would be if I was shooting at non-artillery units. I was actually shooting at the British artillery. So I'd be using this column over here. Uh, fortunately, it's the same result. As you can see, I believe I rolled a three on that. And that's the same result retreat. So nothing changes. It's just that you use a separate column. And the same thing applies with rifle fire, as you can see. Against non-artillery, you use this column against uh, artillery units, you use this column. So you get slightly different results. Okay, so with that, we know that the battery of guns here are forced to retreat. Now, it's the retreat distance is one hex. That's always the case normally. And I'm going to choose to retreat in this hex back with the leader. And that's it, folks. That's all there is to it. Now, I ignore any references to other units in this hex. These guys don't... Uh, or they're not forced to retreat or make a morale check to see if they retreat, which is normally the case, uh, like as a result of close combat. That would not happen here, so they remain where they are, unaffected. And this artillery battery, or this section of guns, did retreat to this position. So that's unfortunate. I just wanted to show you guys how shooting worked, particularly regarding uh, against artillery. So that's the situation at the moment, folks. And after this... We're going to go to the rifle fire phase, which is going to basically be the same kind of procedure. Ferguson's rifles will fire. They'll get a plus one for being Ferguson's. Uh, they'll also get a plus one for their first fire. And yeah, they'll target this guy up here. And it's the same thing. You're going to roll twice. If, if you hit, you'll roll twice. Uh, if you don't hit, it's only the one roll. All right, so folks, that is the end of defensive artillery fire. All right, so for Ferguson's rifles, I'll show you guys what happened here. And again, I'm being a little bit more detailed with the rules here, so you guys can uh, see it in action. Uh, I won't be doing this throughout the battle, but uh, I'll give you an idea. His first roll was a total of eight with modifiers. He had a plus one for being Ferguson's rifles, uh, plus one for firing for the first time in the battle. And uh, he was firing against light infantry, however with a minus one, and his total was eight. As you can see here, his target unit, which you can see, he's adjacent, is right here. So that's light infantry unit. His total was eight, which did score a hit. He needed a six with a strength, fire strength point of two. Uh, adjacent, he needed a six, which he got. We come down here to rifle fire damage. He, he rolled a three, once again, I got a three, against non-artillery for rifles. 
and there it is minus 1 a.m what that means if we come over here we'll see army morale loss so what that means is the patriots just suffered an army morale loss of one this little army morale marker for the patriots drops down from 20 to 19. So that gives you an idea how army morale can be affected here. Interesting, because the unit itself didn't actually take any major losses, but it was a demoralizing event nonetheless. And if you can do this multiple times in the battle, that's a great thing. This first fire marker is now removed and taken out of play. Only applies the first time you fire. And that's it for the British. They don't have any more rifle armed troops, so... It's going to be the close combat phase and the close combat sequence. I'll just let you know ahead of time, I don't intend to use Ferguson's rifles in close combat. Uh, they're not forced to engage in close combat because they are lights, uh, or rifle equipped, I should say. Uh, but the others are going to be forced to fight because they are adjacent. Uh, if you're adjacent to an enemy, you have to attack. And if there is an enemy adjacent to you, it has to be attacked. That's the kind of way it works. But that being said, you can kind of choose who you actually fight with. This is the start of the close combat phase. And the first thing we want to do is we want to designate our attacks. <clears throat> now, the basic rule of this is that if you're adjacent to an enemy, your unit has to attack. Uh, and if there's an enemy unit adjacent to you, it has to be attacked. But how you distribute your attacks is totally up to you. Uh, the exception is artillery, and the exception is rifle-armed troops, like Ferguson's here, which do not have to attack the enemy, and I'm choosing not to do so. Now, the attacker is the player with initiative. The opponent, the Patriots in this case, is considered the defender throughout the combats in this turn, or this part of the turn. Uh, this unit right here, the 49th Regiment of Foot, does have to attack because he's, he's adjacent to this enemy unit. In addition, this enemy unit has to be attacked. Over here, we have a stack of two units. Both of these units, because they're adjacent to enemy, have to attack somebody. Now, they're adjacent to two enemy units, uh, both of which have to be attacked. Now, we already know this guy is going to be attacking him. So there's no requirement for any of the units here to attack here. But they do have to attack somebody. And in this case, they're going to attack here which, let's see, what do I want to do? Actually, I'm going to have this unit, the Welsh Fusiliers, join the 49th to attack this unit. The bottom unit, the 28th foot, is going to attack this unit. And he will be supported by the Queen's Rangers, which are up here, who also have to attack. And the only enemy they can attack is this one. So basically, it's going to be like this. These two units will be attacking him, and these two units will be attacking him. Now, it's not, it might not be the best idea simply because I'm attacking upslope. Uh, never a good idea. Once you've designated those attacks, the next step is to remove pin markers from anywhere on the battlefield. There are none at the moment because we just started. So we're going to skip past that. Next is conduct all designated close combats. And that follows its own little sequence, which is shown here the close combat sequence. Step one, determine your odds ratio. Uh, step two is to determine lead units. That's where you pick one unit that's attacking the enemy uh, to be the lead unit. It's important because he'll be the one that follows up and moves into the enemy's hex if he vacates it because of a retreat result. After the attacker declares its lead unit, defender may choose cavalry or Indian withdrawal. Uh, cavalry and Indians, if they're in the battle, uh, can decide to withdraw. They don't have to actually fight in the combat. There's also artillery capture, which can happen at this time. Next is DRMs, our determined die roll modifiers. And we'll go to a table for that. After that is select and resolve tactics. Both sides can choose tactics cards or chits, you know, both varieties in the game, your choice which one you want to use. I'm using the cards. Finally, resolve the close combats. And next, momentum decision. You can use your momentum chits to uh, alter the results of the die rolls in the combat. That's useful. Uh, next is apply close, co close combat results. 
uh, followed by making the army morale adjustments like we've seen earlier the artillery or the Ferguson's rifles uh, caused an army morale loss to the Patriots through their fire. Next is gain momentum. You can gain momentum as results from combat if you're effective at it. Uh, and also advance after combat. That's where your lead units will advance into hexes vacated by the defender. Uh, and that's it. That's where you finish the close combat. And that ends the turn for the current player. And then the second player picks up. So let me go through this uh, by starting with the odds determination. If we look down here at our forces involved, let me zoom in just a little bit. And we're going to look at this combat at least. All right, we know we have three strength points here. And we have three strength points from the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. So that's a total of six. I'm going to write this down. And the defender's strength points in this case are two. So the odds ratio is easy in this case. It's three to one odds in favor of the British. So there's our odds ratio. Now the next thing to do is determine the lead units uh, of the attacker. Now in this case, I'm going to choose the 49th. They're both the same, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers and the 49th. So uh, yeah, they're going to be the lead unit. Defender also chooses his lead unit, which is automatically going to fall on those light infantry back here. Now, normally they have to be parade order troops. Uh, artillery cannot be lead units either. And it's important to know which units are the lead units. It'll affect, uh, morale will affect the combat. So with that, we're going to go right to, I believe, combat. DRMs are figured out at this point. Well, there would be uh, cavalry withdrawal and that kind of thing. But uh, that's not the case here. There won't be any withdrawals. So the next thing is to determine the DRMs. And zoom out just a little bit so we can get a look at this. There's your list of close combat DRMs. And they're all cumulative, of course. And we start off with the attacker's bonuses right here. And then we'll look at the defender's bonuses. And this one down here, the general benefit result of tactics card, which I'll show you what I choose for this combat. Now, as I mentioned, uh, morale is important. When you choose the unit that's leading, we're going to use his mod uh, morale uh, modified by the current army morale modifier. And let's take a look at this. This is the lead unit. And his morale is currently a plus one, as you can see there. If we look over here, the army morale track, this... Uh, will tell us what our modifier to that will be. And all units' morale is going to be modified by the current army's morale. In this case, we're at high morale, which means unit morale is normal. So there's not going to be any modifier to this unit's uh, current morale mod, which is plus one. So that's what we're going to be using here. And we'll also do likewise for the defender, but we'll get to that. We're going to look at the attacker first. His net morale, net morale of attacker's lead unit. That's what we just figured. It's a plus one. Close combat DRMs of attacker's commanding leader. Uh, there is none. Look at Knippausen here. His uh, modifier for close combats is the first value, which is a one. Um, so that's what the modifier would be if he was stacked with these units that are fighting. Well, this unit right here, actually. Or here, because this unit is involved in this combat as well. But he's not stacked, so he won't play any role whatsoever in any of these combats. However, he is adjacent. He will be able to use tactics cards. We'll get into that later. Uh, so there's no modifier for that. So let's back out again here. And go back to our modifiers here for the attacker. So next one is any defending unit is a rifle unit. Except those mentions there, which there isn't. This is a light infantry unit. Uh, plus one, any defending unit is disrupted or shattered. Nope. Any attacker is a dragoon or disrupted or shattered units. Uh, nope. All defending units are militia. I believe militia are shown as kneeling. They're not militia. And defender is surrounded. Not the case here. It defines it. Basically, it's what you would imagine. Uh, surrounded by enemy units or terrain that cannot move through. So on and so forth. So, yeah, the only modifier here for the attacker is his morale bonus, which is a plus one. 
So I'm going to jot that down, plus 1. And now we're going to look at the Defender. And basically the same kind of modifiers. There's the net morale of the Defender's lead unit. And if we look at their morale, zoom in down here, that's that top number there above the 2. It's a 0. So there's no modifier uh, to that Maryland unit at the top of the slopes. However, we got, do have to modify that by the Army's current uh, morale state, which is high morale for the Patriots. So no modifier at this point. So it's going to be a zero. So no mod. Let's see what else we got here. Again, close combat DRM of defendant's commanding leader. There is none in the hex. Any attacking unit is rifle. Uh, any attacking unit is a rifle unit. Um, except Ferguson's rifles or the PA rifle. Uh, there's a penalty there. All attacking units are American militia. No, all attacking units are attacking across a run or up slope. Yes, all the attackers are attacking up slope. So there is a minus one, which benefits the defender. It hurts the attacker. So let me put a minus one here. We got a plus one and we got a minus one. Now there's only a single die roll here when the players don't roll off against each other. So all these modifiers are cumulative with all these. All units attacking across a Ford hex side? No. All units attacking into field works? No. Any units attacking across a non-Ford Brandywine Creek? And no, no. Any defending units at Birmingham Meeting House? No. All defending units are in a town hex? No. Attackers surrounded, and so on. And now we're going to go to tactics cards. So the total modifier so far, my friends, is a plus one, minus one, nothing. But three to one advantage, that's still pretty nice. All right, so let's take a look at the tactics we're going to be uh, considering for this combat. All right, so let's look at the Patriots' choice of tactics. Now there's a total of, let's see, eight tactics cards to choose from. And these four are the basic cards that all combats, all units can utilize. All right, so you get your stand fast, you withdraw, attack an echelon, and skirmish. So these are the four basic tactics that normally can always be taken. However, if a leader is adjacent or stacked with units in the combat, there's additional cards that can be used. And that includes commit reserve, frontal assault, turn flank, and refuse flank. Now, in the case of these two cards, these also have an additional requirement. They require an open flank that both an attacking unit and the defending unit share. In other words, there's a hex that has nobody else in it. And if we look at our combat down here, that is not the case. Uh, this unit and this unit here are attacking this unit in the combat. Uh, the only side hexes they both share would be here which is occupied by Ferguson's, so it's not an open flank or an open hex, and this hex over here, which again is not open. So there is no open uh, hex in this case, which means these two options are not available. Uh, so we'll set them aside. These two would be available uh, for the Patriots, except there is no officer adjacent or stacked with the combat units. So these two are out of the question. That leaves us with the four basic tactics available for the Patriots. And the same situation, except they do actually have Knipphausen, who is adjacent to units in the combat. So he's going to be able to use at least, let's see, he won't be able to use that one, and turn flank. They're not available because there is no open hex or open flank. So... The only choices he have are the four basic plus commit reserve and frontal attack because he is adjacent to the combat. Knipphausen can use these two additional cards for the British. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to totally leave this open and I'm going to draw up to three cards. Let's start with the Patriots. Let me shuffle them first. I'm going to get three cards here. One of these cards won't be chosen. 
So I'm going to eliminate that one. So this is their three options. Starting with this, withdrawal. Do I want to consider withdrawing? No. So we're going to take the next card, stand fast. And I'm going to say, yeah, we're going to take that one. So stand fast is their card. Now let's draw some for the Brits. And I'm going to totally leave this random because they have choice of just about every card in here because of Knipphausen. And I'm just doing this for fun, folks. Throw a little randomness into the mix. And let's draw three cards. We'll take the top three. Starting with the top, I'm going to take the card that makes the most sense. Uh, skirmish? No, I don't want to do that. Frontal Assault, that sounds pretty good, although it might be brutal. Uh, you know what, I'll take it. Frontal Assault up the slopes. So we got to stand fast against the Frontal Assault. Now what we do with this is we compare these tactics on this chart here, uh, and it'll give us an additional modifier to the combat. Simple as that. And, of course, I wasn't paying attention. But you know what? It's still fun. The attacker will be penalized, as we can see here. Frontal assault. Frontal assault. The defender is standing fast. Uh, I'm the attacker, so it's a minus one. So that's a minus one to the modified die roll. So, yeah, this is where we're going to roll our dice. There's no momentum going to play a role in this, so it's a straight-up roll. Uh, and then apply the close combat results. So we're going to roll the dice. We'll use red because the red is the British and that is the attacker. So we're going to roll this and give it a minus one. Unfortunately, we're penalized for coming up that hill because of our tactics. Uh, kind of like Bunker Hill all over again. Six minus one is five. See what we get. Close combat's results. We got a uh, five. Uh, find our ratio. It's three to one in the attacker's favor, which is here. Go down to the result of a five, and this is the result. This is our listed as attacker slash defender. So attacker, no effect. Nothing happens to him. Defender, R, which is retreat. Uh, the defending unit, in this case, the light infantry, will have to fall back one hex. Retreating. This unit will fall back. I could put him here, I think, but I'm not going to. I'm going to put him back one hex, and that's where he is. We look here in the sequence. Uh, play close combat results. Uh, army morale adjustments. There was none. Gain momentum. None were gained. You have to get significant results. The attacker needs to score at least a, a die roll of a 10, uh, and so on. Uh, final step is advance after combat. That's where the lead unit has to advance forward. The vacated hex and any other units that were involved in the comet can also advance up to the stacking limit, uh, which was this top unit here, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. And you know what? They will advance as well. So, boom. Both units are now occupying that hill position. It was quite effective. Uh, light infantry just could not hold the position, even though they had a slight advantage. Numbers were too much for the Patriots. They fell back. And that's the combat. And after this, the attacking player chooses the next combat to resolve, and that would be this one, where we have the 28th Foot and the Queen's Rangers both engaging in the same type of combat here against this Maryland regiment for the Patriots. Same type of situation. Uh, and that's it, folks. That's, that's basically how a combat works. This will be the end of the British player's turn. And I'm going to advance the turn marker which is right here. Turn marker will be advanced, and we're going to flip this to the Patriot side. And there we go. So there's a position, a top and a bottom for each side, and you just flip the marker whose turn it is. So we're flipped to the Patriot side of turn one. So I'm going to go to that next and show you the results of that bit of work for the patriots and see what they can do okay folks i hope you enjoy i'm going to post this for you guys and get into the patriots response to this little combat taking place take care folks